Hi everyone, Chris Gavillier here. Thanks for joining me on today's video and I'm pretty excited about this one because in the last few months I've actually, like everyone else, I've actually restricted myself to the amount of load that I've been lifting in the gym. And I've been playing around with a few concepts in my head. And as you probably may know, I love my blood flow restriction, but I also really enjoy my high load lifting. So this actual training program was actually quite a challenge for me. And really when I think about how I could give it a title, it, perhaps it could be how to get more powerful with only 40 kilos. Now that's a massive asterisk here. When we look at how we prescribe our strength programs, science actually tells us that load is king. And the ability to train with these high external loads in strength sessions is that prerequisite for the improvements that we want to see in athletic performance, such as sprint time, jumping distance, and, and throwing as well. However, sometimes training age, or in the case of what I'm going to do here today, is that lack of suitable training equipment may actually prevent the ability to use these high training loads. And in particular, the recent few months during the peak period of COVID has seen the shutdown of gyms, unfortunately, and also that access to really good training facilities. So during this COVID shutdown period, I've deliberately experimented with my own training, limiting to the actual load I can lift to only 40 kilos. Once again, there's an asterisk here, but you know, I thought, why do I pick 40 kilos? Because I think it's comfortably within that 20% of my maximum. And if you're into your BFR, you'll understand why I chose 20%. However, as I didn't use what we would expect to be enough external load or weight, I ensured that I used other methods to add extra stress to my training stimulus. And in particular, I used isometrics, lifting bands, and also BFR. With respect to isometrics, I think we're all really aware of the advantages of this type of training such as they produce those really high amounts of muscle activation, and this leads to that more efficient nervous system. The second one is, is the effect of the muscular groups are really joint specific, so that this can have a really good carryover to the sporting action of the athlete, and also can provide a better visual and kinesthetic memorization of different movement images. They require less energy to perform, and lastly, it's pretty simple equipment that we're using here, in this case, a tie-down strap. If you're looking for recent presentations on isometric training, do yourself a favor and search anything from Alex Natera. The second author is Yuri Verkinchansky, and in my opinion, they're both actually giving us the same message. According to Verkinchansky, there's two types of isometric regimes. The first one is an explosive isometric regime, and this emphasizes the speed of tension development. This is explode if we think about Alex Natera. And the second is the not explosive isometric regime, which is that grind or the build concept if we refer back to Alex's work. With Verkinchansky, he also encourages the combination of isometric exercises with dynamic movements and also the addition of external or resistance exercises. With respect to the use of dynamic exercise, one in particular that Verkinchansky talks about is the shock regime. And this type of training positively affects the neuromuscular system by increasing the motor neuron stimulations intensities and creates the elastic potential of muscle tension. In this case here, a simple drop or depth jump is an example of this. Other terminology and concepts that I used here was around Jay Schroeder's long duration isometrics. And what I did here, my interpretation is that I then broke some of the terminology into three phases. The first one was position, and this was some of the prerequisite work around isometric extreme hold positions. And this was here to help develop the structures that are needed in more complex high velocity movements seen in phase two and in phase three. Phase two was about absorb, and this teaches the athlete to absorb force in position, and the capacity to, for the body to absorb force in an optimal technical position provides that next foundational layer for the next phase where we're actually trying to get the body to produce force. And that's the third phase, which is what they call create. And the emphasis in this phase is to execute the exercises that produce force as rapidly as possible. And here a depth or a drop jump is a really great example of this type of exercise that you perform in phase three. The addition of blood flow restriction was used as a proxy for high loads. As I said earlier, load is still king. 
but BFR training with loads between 20 to 30% of 1RM have been reported to increase strength and performance parameters across a variety of exercises and exercise modalities. Although the improvements are typically not as great as training with higher loads, BFR is well researched and I thought that it potentially could provide this solution to athletes who wouldn't have access to a lot of gym equipment and load. Acute increases in anabolic hormone concentrations and activation of type two muscle fibers are also positive aspects with BFR training. Now I wanna briefly explain the training structure. Phase one was a traditional high load lifting program and this is how I'd lift pretty much all year round in different variations. So I thought that any testing results would be indicative of this type of training for me. In this here, this video is a short highlight of some of the session content in phase one. I still used BFR in this phase, but used it primarily in the first few warm up sets and then in the final finishes. All the main sets were performed without the BFR cuffs on and at all stages, load was still key. As you'll see in this video, I also perform partial range lifts to really try and push that load aspect that I would normally not be able to do. I use the rest periods to superset with exercises that I feel wouldn't compromise my main lift. And as you see here, I'm doing long duration single leg Bulgarian squats. With respect to the lower body, I can only push heavy loads on my left knee due to previous joint issues with my right knee. If you've watched any of my other videos, I talk a lot about the concept of good joint and bad joint. And I show you how to train for performance if you have these issues. Here, I use a Smith machine to do an isometric push. And this is one of the many exercises I do here. Phase two was the start of my light load isometrics and BFR concept. And this was six weeks long, and it's coincided with about two weeks into the COVID gym shutdown period. Phase three was a continuation of the previous phase. I progressed the isometrics, now I'll include the explode concept, and the plyometrics also incorporated the concept of create all the depth jumps. I really tried to increase any kind of external band loading as well in this phase, as I really wanted to try and push my results in this type of training. Briefly looking at the training program framework, the first part of the program was high reps, low load BFR exercise. And this is typically what we would see with BFR type training. And this was usually just one exercise here. And this was done to really set me up for the whole session. I'd also be doing an upper and a lower body split where I'd perform two upper body sessions per week and two lower body sessions as well per week. The second part of the program involved the isometrics and was the main part that may have assisted in any kind of athletic performance parameters as seen by my testing results. The first block of isometrics incorporated the concept of building the force to get used to the isometrics. And the second block I incorporated explode as I was now familiar with the movement. So really trying to progress the type of training to ensure I did it safely. I explored different joint angles and the external load was added through the addition of bands, BFR, light weights, dumbbells, and so forth, but no more than 40 kilos. And as I said earlier, all the isometric exercises were supersetted with a plyometric exercise. The third section was ancillary strength, and these here really complemented the body parts that I was training at the time, so upper or lower body. At times, I'd also include other ancillary exercises that I felt were important to my own training as a whole, such as I'd add in extra hamstring and calf work on an upper body day, because I would tend to neglect it if I never did it then anyway. These next few videos will demonstrate to you some of how these exercises looked in phase two and three. This video in particular shows you my knee dominant type exercises and the progressions according to the different loadings. So here you would see that I would use the band adding in the BFR, and then I'd be looking for opportunities to increase that external stress without using high load. So I'd be looking towards something such as a dumbbell. I had that at my disposal, but then another way of also doing is finding a bag and filling that full of anything that you can find, books, water bottles, and so forth. This video here is my hip dominant exercise, my isometric deadlift. Once again, I'd be looking as BFR as my primary isometric loading and then adding more bands for that level of complexity. The supersets once again, this here is that concept of in phase two of drop and absorb. And then in phase three, this would have then looked like a single leg drop jump because I couldn't do that on my right knee. 
This video is actually a really short session overview of my upper body session that I would do. And in particular, it really encompasses the concepts of using supersets to include relevant plyometric exercises, or in this case here, you'll see a lot of my ancillary exercises that we tend to neglect. I found over time that I really needed to get quite inventive with the items that I had around me to ensure that I was able to get through the session quickly, but it was actually convenient for me to do. So putting the dumbbells up on the plates was quite useful. After I'd complete, this is my section two of my program framework. I'd head into my section three, which would be high reps ancillary work, which would complement my type of training that I'm doing for that day. So here we had floor bench, bent over row, and some shrugs. And then I'd add in some single leg hamstring and a really great way of doing it when you have minimal equipment here. With regards to the testing, I really try to encompass as many different types of tests for both the upper and the lower body. With respect to the lower body, I can't load one knee with a lot of heavy load, so a traditional squat just won't appear here. From an isometric viewpoint, I looked at hip extension or a glute bridge using both one and two legs, and I also included a single leg isometric hamstring test here as well. Dynamic exercises included 10 pogo jumps, which is not too bad on my knee, and three single leg hops for distance on my good left knee. The upper body testing, I included a bench press, and I have quite a lot of velocity data across submaximal load, so a really good test to have here. I actually had a feeling that my 1RM might diminish throughout this type of training, but I thought perhaps I may see something with my lighter loads, and this could highlight the effectiveness or perhaps the non-effectiveness of this type of training. More dynamic tests included a six kilo med ball chest thrust for distance, as well as a bench throw on a Smith machine using light loads of 20 and 30 kilos. And I'll have some videos a little bit later on with those tests. If we look at the training structure and how I tested across these different phases, phase one corresponded with the end of the traditional high load lifting, and we weren't in the middle of COVID. Phase two was the start of the isometric light load BFR training program, and this was right in the middle of the COVID shutdown period. So all I had access to was the single leg hops, med ball throw for distance, and bench press velocities. This was obviously the advantage of adding in the med ball and particularly the single leg hop test as I could perform it anywhere just to see how my training was going. Phase three was post COVID shutdown. So I was back in my workplace and my gym and I was able to perform the full gamut of tests as I now had access to the force plate and the Smith machine. With respect to the testing exercises, I actually felt that I had a high level of competence. I'd done them in the past quite a lot, but I made sure I didn't do them during my training because I wanted to make sure that the improvements I had was a true reflection of my training and not improvements in my technique. My hypothesis, Look, I really wasn't quite sure. I, I was on a real journey here and I had a theory in my head that I may see something or if anything, just keep a plateau of my results. And I really would have been happy with that, but I was determined to see how hard I could push my body in phase two and phase three and also this concept. Now, more importantly, what are the results? Because I think this is what we want to find out. Did this training actually help improve uh, some sort of athletic performance and what I think is a reasonably comprehensive battery of tests. If we move firstly just onto the lower body, the hip thruster, I saw some really nice improvements here in both double and single leg in both left and right. So anywhere between 11 to 13% on single leg and up to 18% on double leg activity. Single leg hamstring isometric test also saw some really good improvements here. I was happy with my right leg because that's my bad knee and to have that improvement where it was pretty much even now with my good knee, I was, I was quite happy with that outcome. Pogo's 10 jumps. This actually brings the best of my five attempts on the force plate that I do here and you'll see I saw a really nice improvement in my flight time. Three single leg hops for distance. Now in phase two, I did this on grass and phase three, I was back into the gym. So I had that really nice consistent synthetic track surface that I had at the end of phase one. An interesting note here was on my jump at the end of phase three, that 7.5 meter jump. I felt that I really nailed it technically. And though I didn't train it during this period, it was actually just an interesting observation. I think as coaches, these are good observations for us to take aside from just a number. And I actually wondered if it was due to the training I'd done to enable me to perform it better. 
or had I just nailed it? But irrespective, I think we take these type of improvements. The results of the bench press were really interesting. Here we have my results at the end of phase one from 80 to 160 kilos. Now over time, my 1RM has fluctuated quite a lot depending on my age and also the training I've been doing, but this was quite indicative of where I was at this point of time. If we bring it across phase two, this is the really surprising stuff. I'm still able to achieve an improvement at 80 to 100 kilos. And then once again, phase three, I still had more of an improvement from that initial phase one. Once again, at 120 and 140 kilos, I'm still seeing an improvement, although not as much at the heavier load at 140 kilos. But what was really surprising here, that at 120 and 140 kilos, the weight felt exceptional in my hand. However, at 160 kilos, it was just too heavy. So this really says to you that if your testing data is driven by 1RM results, you need to make sure that there's high load in there. However, if your submaximal velocities or your quality of movement contraction is really important, there's something here. And once again, I can't stress how amazing it was that the 140 kilos felt really good in my hand. But once again, 160 just, I put it in and I actually re-racked it because it just felt too heavy. If we look at the med ball thrust for distance, I also saw an improvement here, more so in that phase three, and similarly to the single leg hops, once I let out of my hand, I just knew I nailed it. So there's a large technical component in some of these tests, but I didn't practice this test at all during this COVID shutdown. Therefore, I was really surprised with that. The bench throw also displayed good improvements. I stayed with peak velocity as these measures due to the ballistic nature of this exercise. At the end of phase two, I was still at home. I didn't have access to the Smith machine, so I had to wait until the end of phase three when I was back at work. For this here, I used the Tendo system, whereas I used the Elite Form camera system for the bench press. And to be honest, although I'm a big fan of the Elite Form camera system, I also love the simplicity of this machine. And once again, I think the improvements here were reflective of the bench press velocity results. From a performance aspect and overall I was actually really quite surprised by the results I had here. I wasn't quite sure what to expect due to not lifting heavy loads, and even more so as I lifted using this type of concept for almost 12 weeks, so I thought that perhaps there would have been some level of detraining. And also for me, I, I love heavy load lifting. Talking about the upper body again briefly, the bench press once again really surprised me. That 140 kilos on my hand felt great. Once again, it shows you if your metrics are governed by one around test, you need to lift heavy. It was actually good having a portable at home elite form system to test myself in a phase two, and it really motivated me heading into phase three to keep pushing this type of training. The med ball throw took a while to see any kind of change. Technique plays a large part in these type of tests, and I feel that I actually nailed this movement once again. The bench press throw showed good improvements, and I feel it was reflective of the submax velocity seen in the bench press. For the lower body, the isometric test showed good improvements across both the glute and the hamstring tests. With more of a practical aspect, the three single leg hops for distance only showed improvement after phase three. It was actually good to have this test in as I was able to perform this whenever and wherever I wanted to. And from a training viewpoint, I feel that the addition of the plyometric drop jump type activities may have been a good addition that resulted in this jump performance. Similar to the med ball throw, I felt I really nailed the technique, which considering I didn't practice it was very pleasing. In hindsight, it would have been good to get a strength measure for the lower body, however, I didn't. I'm somewhat limited to a single leg type knee dominant strength test, but perhaps a single leg isometric push test here would have been good in this scenario. Once again, I think the word surprising really comes here from a testing viewpoint. From a theoretical standing, for me, it made sense that this type of training combined the concept of isometrics, BFR, and plyometrics would work. Again, if your success is determined by your 1RM, then this type of training program may not be for you. Although with limited equipment, it would be the best choice. If however, success of your training program is highlighted by speed of movement, distance thrown, jump, then this type of program would be of benefit irrespective of access to facilities or not. And in a lot of sporting settings, this may have been better transferred to actual sporting performance. 
I don't have a sport at present, so I wasn't able to go and see if it actually had a direct transfer to performance enhancement or maintenance of performance across this shutdown period. But I really think that it did show me some sort of potential for this type of training. And look, the other thing was is that I enjoyed the training. It was really quick and I pulled up so good the next day. So I was actually able to continually train hard back to back across the whole week and across multiple weeks of training and phase two and phase three. I enjoyed it, it was short, it was sharp. I felt great doing it. And I think that's really important when we're training as well, uh, training our athletes, but also as coaches prescribing is, is that the type of training needs to be enjoyed by the athlete. If they're waking up really sore, they can't go and do their skill the next day. So that may be a hindrance for them. So there may be something in that as well is that we're actually trying to improve the muscular qualities, but we're giving the athlete the ability to go and train really well the next day. And that's going to give the great transfer. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it gives you some food for thought. It's a real change in mindset in terms of this type of lifting. And I've actually been able to see improvements with some of the other athletes that I've used this type of training during the same shutdown. So it's not just me. Uh, look, I'm a little bit older and I don't have a sport to go to. So, you know, this is, this is obviously of N of one, but I think it shows promise. And I think as coaches, we really need to be open to these concepts for when opportunities arrive for the athletes. I hope you get something from that. If you have any questions about this type of training, just shoot me a message. And also, if you know of anyone who may benefit from this type of training stimulus, please share this with them and they can then get back to me if they have any further questions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.